Waterloo is the battle by which the Duke of Wellington is defined. His victory there sealed his place in history. It gave him wealth, influence and prestige, and soon propelled him into a new career in politics. But there he would find new battles to fight, political battles, in which even his good name would be at stake. I must have visited the battlefield of Waterloo 30 times, and it never ceases to move me. On the morning of the 18th of June, 1815, huge French and Allied armies had drawn up and faced each other across these fields just south of Brussels. 140,000 men were crammed into these three square miles. For the Duke of Wellington, this battle was to be the culmination of his military career. Months before, the war had seemed to be over and Napoleon defeated, the result partly of Wellington's victories in Spain and Portugal. But Napoleon had escaped, gathered a vast army around him and was now marching on Brussels. Wellington had to stop him. It was a battle that would decide the fate of Europe. Wellington knew that he was at a disadvantage, but characteristically, he gave no sign of it. He'd been cut off from his Prussian allies by the French. He'd taken up a good defensive position on this low ridge, but his army of British, Germans, Dutch and Belgians contained many inexperienced units and was badly outgunned by the French, just across the valley. Napoleon had won the campaign's opening round, but Wellington was a canny defensive general. He waited to see how Napoleon would launch his attack. Wellington regarded the emperor as an opportunist. He was definitely no gentleman. He was a dog who'd risen out of the anarchy of the French Revolution a time of chaos and bloodshed. But he'd masterminded France's conquest of Europe, and the Duke had a high regard for Napoleon's military skills. He once said, I would at any time rather have heard that the French army had received a reinforcement of 40,000 men than that he had arrived to take command. And now, for the first time, the Duke and the Emperor were to meet in battle. At 11.30, Napoleon began the battle with a violent cannonade. This was followed by an attack on a small farm complex, which was in position on Wellington's right. It was vital that Wellington didn't lose it. The enemy commenced a furious attack upon our post at Hougemont. I had occupied it with a detachment of guards, and it was maintained throughout the day with the utmost gallantry. This was notwithstanding the repeated efforts of large bodies of the enemy. The British held Hougoumont. Napoleon had wasted the morning. It was not until one day that Wellington had to face the Emperor's main attack. 16,000 infantry advanced against Wellington's centre and the farmhouse, La Haye Saint, that dominated this part of the field. Although the French failed to take the farm, they surrounded it, broke some Allied troops on the ridge behind, and continued to advance.
the situation was critical. Wellington ordered in the reserves he'd been keeping for just such a moment, his heavy cavalry. They launched themselves into the greatest cavalry attack in British history. The French infantry were caught in the open. Front ranks were hacked down, the survivors fled. Those terrible grey horses, how they fight, exclaimed Napoleon. However, flushed with success, the British cavalry went out of control, galloping right into the French lines, where they were dashed to pieces. All the while, hundreds of Allied soldiers were being lost to the steady pounding of the French cannon. The battle was reaching crisis point. The Duke relied on the support of the Prussian army, led by Prince Blücher, with whom he had a good working relationship. He watched for signs of the Prussian arrival all afternoon. Wellington faced certain defeat without his allies. Napoleon had detached troops to delay the Prussians. And by four o'clock, Wellington was desperate for Blücher to arrive. His men were already very tired. And now they faced attack from wave after wave of French horsemen. They formed squares, blocks of men bristling with bayonets, and stood like rocks beneath the torrent. The French swirled round them trying to break through, but volley after volley of musket fire cut them down. The French were helpless in the face of such discipline and determination. Wellington looked out towards Napoleon almost in disappointment and exclaimed, damn the fellow, he is a mere pounder after all. The Duke was everywhere. Mounted on his favourite charger, Copenhagen, he rode around encouraging his men, giving meticulous direction to the officers, and taking refuge in the squares when necessary. But the battle was far from over. At about six o'clock, the French once again seemed to gain the upper hand. The enemy made a desperate effort to force our centre near the farm of Lay Saint. The farm, after a severe contest, was defeated. Only 42 men from the garrison survived. Losses were appalled. In one regiment of more than 700 men, two-thirds were killed or wounded. The Duke murmured, Night or the Prussians must come. Then there was an unexpected lull. The Prussians had finally arrived. Napoleon hesitated over his next move. Half an hour's doubt was undoing a lifetime's achievement. The Duke used the time to reinforce his hard-pressed center and rally wavering troops. Hard pounding this, gentlemen. Stand fast, we must not be beat. At 7.30, Napoleon finally decided to order France's crack troops to advance. The Allies could hear the drums and yells of Vive l'Empereur as Napoleon's Imperial Guard, his last reserve, came up this over the debris of previous attacks. Wellington himself was on hand at this crucial spot. His staff had already been killed and wounded around him, and Lord Uxbridge had advised him to take fewer risks. I will, he said. Directly I see those fellows driven off. He gave the vital orders himself. Stand up, guards. Make ready, fire. At exactly this moment, the Prussian attack was also biting deep. And as the Imperial Guard fell back, the French army broke. 
Wellington stood up in his stirrups and waved his hat to signal a general advance. Napoleon's army was routed. Wellington's victory was absolute. It's true that Wellington was fighting an ailing Napoleon, whose genius was never fully displayed. It's also true that without the Prussians, there'd have been no victory. But this was always a coalition campaign, and Wellington fought here in the correct assumption that Blucher would support him. The Duke's real skill, and that wonderful quiet tenacity that contemporaries call bottom, was displayed up here that day keeping that oh-so-thin red line steady until the weight of the alliance could crush Napoleon. Waterloo was enshrined in British history. There was nothing quite on the scale of Trafalgar Square, but this great triumphal arch was built at Hyde Park Corner, and in due course, Waterloo Station, Waterloo Bridge, and scores of Waterloo Roads celebrated the victory. Wellington himself was an international hero loaded with arms. Parliament voted him a huge sum to buy a 20,000 acre estate at Stratfield Say. He also purchased Apsley House here. The gratitude of the relieved monarchs and leaders of Europe knew no bounds. Wellington gets loaded with gifts by all sorts of states and individuals, and you've got quite a lot of them here. We've got an enormous number here at Apsley House. He was showered with porcelain services, with silver, with silver gilt. The sovereigns across Europe were so relieved that Napoleon had been defeated. And this is one of a pair of modest little candlesticks. Yes, these very splendid candelabra were presented to the Duke by the merchants and bankers of the City of London. Terrific detail. Extraordinary workmanship, huge scale, and wonderful iconography. And over here we've got these Field Marshal's batons. That's right. And I don't think I've ever seen as many in the same place. The rank of Field Marshal is the highest military rank an individual can attain, and he's got so many batons. It is an incredible thought that all these states have given him the highest rank in their armed forces. It's remarkable. Extraordinary statement. I think that just the quantity, this display speaks for itself. Wellington's wife, Kitty, did not share in the Duke's public adulation. She was a shy, insular person who lived at home at Stratfield Say. Wellington had little interest in her. He was appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Occupying Forces in France and was now at the centre of a glittering social world. The Duke was a charismatic man, and there were many opportunities for affairs. It was said that he even slept with two of Napoleon's mistresses, one of whom thought him a more vigorous than the Emperor. But eventually, Wellington decided to limit his relations to the platonic. It was important to behave with decorum, and he would announce, I am the Duke of Wellington and must do as the Duke of Wellington doth. Wellington started to see himself as a statesman. He spent three years working to establish a secure and stable Europe, free from the horrors of war. The Duke returned to England in 1818. He could have settled down to a very comfortable life, enjoying fame, glory, and wealth. But he was a patrician with a sense of duty and wanted to serve his country in peace as he had in war. And also, perhaps, he would got so used to living in the limelight that he couldn't do without it now. Politics beckoned, and, rightly or wrongly, he believed that he knew just what the country needed. But how well would the triumphant general transform into a political tactician? While traveling with his friend, the MP John Croker, the two men used to try to guess what kind of terrain lay on the other side of the hill. 
The Duke himself said, All the business of war, and indeed all the business of life, is to endeavor to find out what you do not know by what you do. That is what I call guessing what is on the other side of the hill. Wellington confidently presumed that he could guess what was on the other side of the hill for Britain and for British politics. And when he was offered a place in the Tory cabinet, he accepted. At his country estate at Stratfield Say, Wellington was able to consider his future political career. Living in the closed and comfortable world of the aristocracy, it must have been easy to be indifferent to the abject poverty not far from the gates of his mansion. But Britain was in the throes of an industrial revolution, and elegant sites like this were increasingly set against a backcloth of upheaval and inexorable change. In the new, squalid, smoke-belching cities like Manchester, a working day was often 18 hours, and half of all children were dying of illness or malnutrition before the age of 10. Discontent turned into agitation, and visions of the French Revolution loomed. The Tory government, in particular, declared its determination to avoid the horrors of revolution by clamping down firmly on any unrest. The Whig opposition was prepared to countenance moderate political change, not because it really believed in it, but as a way of avoiding something far worse. Wellington was a natural Tory and was not ready for change. Not long after he took up his post, the authorities in Manchester sent in the cavalry to put down a demonstration in St. Peter's Fields, demanding political reform. A dozen people were killed in what was known in parody of Waterloo as the Peterloo Massacre. Wellington was one of the 13 ministers who wrote an official supporting the magistrate's action. He had always believed in harsh punishment to maintain discipline amongst his troops. Likewise, he believed in the harshest repression of any public disorder. He feared the mob and the anarchy that would follow. He would announce to his friends, It is very clear to me that the radicals won't be quiet till a large number of them bite the dust. We are the nation in Europe, the least to be trusted, when we are not controlled by the strong arm of the law. Give the people a strong, a just, and if possible, a good government. But above all, a strong one. Wellington's priority was to maintain stability. It was perfectly natural for Wellington, a general, to see politics as simply the defense of the realm in another guise. Over the following years, Wellington acquitted himself well as a cabinet minister. He won favour with the right of the Tory party, and King George IV was fond, even in awe, of the victorious general. Early on the 9th of January 1828, a note was delivered to Apsley House from the Lord Chancellor. While the Duke was still dressing, the Lord Chancellor himself arrived to sweep him off to Windsor. The King wanted him to form a government. The Duke accepted the office of Prime Minister. He turned up here at Number 10 Downing Street on Copenhagen, the horse he'd ridden at Waterloo. The Duke is unique in being the professional soldier in modern British history to become Prime Minister, but he admitted it is an office for the performance of the duties of which I am not qualified, and they are very disagreeable to me. But responsibility had never, for one moment, frightened him. I feel that I am capable of doing or acquiring anything I choose. I must work for myself and by myself. And please God, I shall succeed in establishing in the country a strong government. And then, 
I may retire with honour. His arrogance would make cabinet government difficult, especially when he had to deal with the infighting of his political colleagues. Although his ministers had been scrupulously polite at a dinner Wellington had hosted at Apsley House, it was the courtesy, as one of them put it, of men who had just fought a duel. What's more, most of them already thought the Duke was domineering. Wellington found the task of leading a cabinet infuriating. All my time is employed in assuaging what gentlemen call their feelings. One man wants one thing and one another. They agree to what I say in the morning, and in the evening, up they start with something which deranges the whole plan. I used to be accustomed to carry on things in a quite different manner. I assembled my officers, laid down my plan, and it was carried into effect. The Duke threw himself into his new job with fervour and confidence. His great strengths were his legendary attention to detail and his administrative ability. When an official at the Treasury told him that a certain change in his department's accounting methods was impossible, the Duke said, never mind, if you cannot accomplish it, I will send you half a dozen pay sergeants who will. But his years as a military commander, surrounded by officers who simply obeyed orders, had made him dangerously authoritarian. In May 1828, William Huskisson, colonial secretary in the Duke's cabinet, publicly stepped out of line and voted against the party. Now the Duke's autocratic nature was to show itself. When confronted by the whip, Huskisson wrote to the Duke, I owe it to you to lose no time in affording you an opportunity of placing my office in other hands. In the convoluted etiquette of the time, Huskisson was offering an apology rather than a resignation. Wellington responded with the inflexibility of an officer facing insubordination. Your letter of two this morning, which I received at ten, has surprised me and given me great concern. I have considered it my duty to lay it before the King. A friend of Huskisson's called round to number ten to explain that the letter had been a mistake. Wellington snapped, there is no mistake, there can be no mistake, there shall be no mistake. And he stepped out for a stroll along Birdcage Walk, just in case Huskisson should call in person. Within a few days, other members of the cabinet had walked out in sympathy with Huskisson. Wellington had made a crucial mistake. He had failed to read what lay on the other side of the hill. He should have been uniting his party instead of dividing it. Ahead lay one of the most explosive issues of his day. Since the establishment of the Protestant church in Britain, profound fear and hatred of Roman Catholics was widespread, and discrimination was institutionalized in law. This Catholic church in London was allowed to exist simply because it was an embassy chapel. The demand to repeal these laws came largely from Ireland, where 90% of the population was Catholic, and the issue fueled violent nationalism. The Duke had heard that he couldn't even rely on the partly Catholic army. Wellington himself came from an Anglo-Irish Protestant family, but his years of campaigning on the continent meant that he wasn't unduly concerned by papism. He recognized that concession was expedient to avoid the risk of civil war in Ireland. He was desperate to avoid the anarchy and chaos that he so much dreaded. But in much of Britain, Catholicism was seen as patriotic. If Wellington was to improve the lot of Roman Catholics, he would have to do battle with the King, most of the Cabinet, the Church of England, the House of Lords, and the mass of British public opinion. Handling many of the negotiations with the individual parties in secret, Wellington took on the challenge like a military operation. His biggest obstacle was King George IV. 
whose opposition could block any reform of the anti-Catholic laws. Wellington would need all his diplomatic skills to handle the king's hysterical fury whenever the subject was mentioned. I verily believed he would go mad, said one courtier. The Duke persisted, listening endlessly to threats of abdication and watching tears slip down the royal cheeks. By March 1829, Wellington and his ministers were prepared to resign if the king would not back down and allow him to introduce the reforms. A friend of the Duke's gives an account of the final meeting. It lasted for five tense hours. The king talked the whole time of his conscience. He would not support the measures. The Duke said he'd go to Parliament and state that, having not been allowed to bring forward the measures, he only waited until a successor was appointed. The king replied he must then try to find other ministers. Wellington left with his political career apparently in pieces. But less than two hours later, the king sent a messenger after the duke. He'd backed down. Wellington had forced the king's hand. It was a masterful piece of brinkmanship. He felt that the scale of the challenge had been comparable to Waterloo. In the House of Lords, the Duke made a simple plea, speaking slowly, with no notes, and his arms folded. I have passed a longer period of my life engaged in war than most men, and if I could avoid even one month of civil war, I would sacrifice my life in order to do it. Getting the bill passed was his supreme political achievement. But the issue split his party, and soon the extreme ultra-Tories were attacking him publicly. It would lead to one of the most extraordinary and brash acts of any Prime Minister. When the Earl of Winchelsea suggested that Wellington had an insidious desire for the introduction of popery into every department of the state, Wellington demanded an apology. Winchelsea refused. Despite being Prime Minister, Wellington called upon him to give that satisfaction for his conduct which a gentleman has a right to require and which a gentleman never refuses to give. These were the rules of his class. Wellington met Winchelsea at dawn on Battersea Fields. Are you ready? Yes. Fire. But Winchelsea's arm remained by his side. So Wellington fired wide. ...was assuaged. A suitable apology was then accepted. The Duke had to clear his name. The duel worked and public opinion swung in his favour. Even the London mob, which a few days before had been hooting him, was now cheering. But he destroyed his party. The ultra Tories could not forgive him over Catholic emancipation. Huskisson and his friends still seethed over the resignation letter. The Duke felt besieged. If I had known one-tenth of what I discovered within one month in office, I should never have been the King's minister. I believe there never was a man suffered so much and for so little purpose. But Wellington's suffering wasn't He now faced the growing clamour for political reform. Few men had the vote and the reformers demanded that the franchise should be widened. But Wellington feared that this would open the door to mob rule. In November 1830, in the House of Lords, Earl Grey made a mild speech calling for reform. 
Wellington gave a shockingly uncompromising reply on this sensitive issue. I am not prepared to bring forward any measure of the description alluded to by the noble lord. And I am not only not prepared to bring forward any measure, but I will at once declare that I shall always feel it my duty to resist such measures. There was a stunned silence. The Duke noticed and turned to a colleague. I have not said too much, have I? It was probably a premeditated speech made by a man with extraordinary respect for the British Constitution, an evidence of his unvarnished honesty. But it was a fatal mistake. All hope of compromise with the middle ground had been lost. A public outcry soon followed. A contemporary account relates how events unfolded. The 4th of November. Parliament was opened by the King. The people were very disorderly and hissed the Duke wherever they could see him. The 7th of November. We hear the Radicals are determined to make a riot. The King gets quantities of letters every day telling him he will be murdered. The King is very much frightened and the Queen cries half the day. The Duke is greatly affected by all this. He feels that beginning reform is beginning revolution. By the end of November, Wellington himself was receiving death threats. <clears throat> A few days later, the Duke was entertaining the Prince of Orange to dinner at Apsley House when a note was sent up to him. Several members of his cabinet were waiting downstairs. He discreetly made his apologies. Your grace, your grace. They informed him that large sections of his party, eager for revenge, had turned against him. Reluctantly, the Duke agreed with them that he should resign immediately. And the next morning, he and his ministers went to St. James's Palace, where the King accepted his resignation with tears. As Greville, clerk of the Privy Council, kept a journal. The Duke of Wellington's violent and uncalled for declaration against reform has without doubt sealed his fate. Never was there an act of more egregious folly or one so universally condemned by friends and foes. Wellington and the Tories were now in opposition, blocking all attempts to introduce reform. After an unusually disorderly meeting of the Lords, a general election was called. The Duke himself was not in the Lords that day. He was here at Apsley House with his ailing wife, Kitty. Forgive me sometimes for my... Kitty and the Duke had never been close. They had been tragically unsuited. Wellington, a proud man of action, Kitty a retiring woman with simple interests. Perhaps in her last years, a bond was formed between them. The Duke reflected sadly how strange it was that two people could live together for half a lifetime and only understand one another at the end. As his wife was dying, so too was the old order there was scarcely time to mourn. The news of the election brought a storm of rioting to London. Wellington wrote, 28th of April, 1831. I learned from my servant John that the mob attacked my house and broke about 30 windows. He fired two blunderbusses in the air from the top of the house and the mob went off. They did not care one pin for the poor Duchess being dead in the house. Matters appear to be going as badly as possible. It may be relied upon that we have a revolution. I have never doubted the inclination of the lower orders. They are rotten to the core. They will plunder and annihilate. And we shall witness scenes such as have never occurred in any part of the world. The election was a foregone conclusion. The Whigs won a huge majority, overwhelming the Tories in the House of Commons. So Wellington now blocked the bill in the Lords. 
When the news hit the streets, the rioting spread to Nottingham, Derby and Bristol, where half the city centre was destroyed and hundreds killed or wounded. Wellington was burned in effigy by a hooting mob here at what's now Marble Arch, but was then Tyburn, the traditional site of public executions. The country was in chaos, and the king begged Wellington to give Eventually, risking accusations of hypocrisy, the Duke agreed to let the bill through. It was probably the most remarkable decision of his career. In the end, I think, the Duke was driven by his powerful sense of duty. The harmony of king, lords and commons was breaking down. It was his duty to restore order. If I had been capable of refusing my assistance to His Majesty, I do not think that I could have shown my face in the streets for shame of having done it. Backed by around a hundred other Tories, Wellington abstained and did not attend the debates. The Great Reform Act was passed in June 1832, doubling the electorate. It was a first step towards parliamentary democracy. But Wellington gained no credit for backing down. It was too too late. One Whig MP wrote in delight, the Duke of Wellington has destroyed himself forever. The derision and even hatred now felt for Wellington was reflected in the caricatures of the day. Many of them have been collected by Sir Edward Ducan. Sir Edward, this is a fantastic collection of Wellington caricatures. What do you like about them? They're very kind. They excite me. They're amusing. They're sardonic. They're strong. But why, why were caricatures like this so important? It's interesting from the point of view of it being a popular opinion poll of the day. Many of the newspapers then, from time to time at any rate, were in the pay of the government. So satire or criticism or the deflation of the pompous, in those days it was something that appealed mightily. The English, you know, liked to pull down their heroes. I'll show you one of my favourite caricatures which exactly exemplifies the point. This caricature here, that's not at all nice. It's a caricature nice. showing him being in league with the devil. The process of Catholic emancipation had been long drawn out and was bitterly fought. And in those days when religion meant so much more to people than, alas, perhaps it does uh, today, that was a filthy insult. Extremely cruel. This is one of my favorites. The grey figure there is Grey, who was Prime Minister after Wellington. And here he is addressing a troop of recalcitrant Tories, <laughs> Wellington shown prominent in Dunce's cap, and Grey, teaching them the verb to reform. I will reform, you will reform, etc. The victor of Waterloo converted to naughty schoolboy. Yes, and he'd saved England, he'd saved our country, this great hero. Soon as he went into politics, he begins to be depicted in a light that is thoroughly unfavorable. But would Wellington's reputation ever recover? In October 1834, the Houses of Parliament burnt down. The construction of these magnificent new buildings marked the changing face of British politics. The roles of the House of Lords and the monarchy were diminishing. Power had shifted to the House of Commons, and modern party politics was taking root. Wellington and his age were being left behind. After nearly 20 years in politics, Wellington had learned from his experiences. In opposition, he took the moderate line. Together, he and Robert Peel, Tory leader in the House of Commons, avoided any confrontation with the Whigs that might drive the government further into the arms of the radical. Respect for Wellington was returning. In the end, the achievement of Waterloo stood for far more than his political mistakes. As the Duke travelled through London, his riding companion, Charles Greville, noted a new reaction. It is not popularity, but reverence. The feeling of the people for him seems to be the liveliest of all popular sentiments. Yet he does nothing to excite it, 
and hardly seems to notice it. One morning in 1834, Wellington was about to go hunting when he received a royal summons. He left immediately for Brighton Pavilion, the royal seaside retreat. The king greeted him in his apartments here and asked him once again to form a ministry. The Whig government, riven by internal wranglings, had fallen. But the 65-year-old Duke declared that Peel must be prime minister. Wellington had learnt much. Perhaps he believed that the changed political climate demanded a leader in the House of Commons, not the House of Lords. But perhaps he knew that he wasn't up to the job. Wellington was becoming less involved in politics and spending more time here at Woolmer Castle, where as Lord Warden of the Cinque Ports, he had an official residence. The Spartan atmosphere and sea air suited him better than the luxury of Apsley House or Stratfield Say. He kept busy, entertaining constantly, writing up to 50 letters a day and sitting regularly in the House of Lords, where, with a hand cupped behind his ear to follow the debate, he was a familiar figure. Like all old soldiers, he was rather deaf. He was a pillar of the establishment and took on numerous responsibilities. He was Chancellor of Oxford University, Constable of the Tower, Lord Lieutenant of Hampshire, and became a father figure to the young Queen Victoria. In 1842, Wellington was also appointed Commander-in-Chief of the Army. He was still a significant political figure, and by now, he'd learnt to bend with the wind. The pressure of popular unrest was once again building. This time, the target was the tax on corn, which kept bread prices artificially high. Despite his own belief in this unpopular tax, Wellington led the House of Lords in throwing it out. When he was once asked what was the best test of a great general, he replied, to know when to retreat and to dare to do it. The tax was abolished after the Duke made a highly effective speech late one night in the Lords. When Wellington left the house in the early hours of the morning, he was cheered. One workman shouted, God bless you, Duke. Typically, Wellington brushed the adulation aside. For heaven's sake, people, let me get on my horse. After this, Wellington gradually faded away from public life. He was still having his portrait painted and even sat for one of the early photographers. But Wellington had had enough of the adulation. I am really tired out and must request to be allowed to seek some repose. All that I desire is to be left alone in peace. In 1852, he died in the bedroom of his beloved Walmer Castle. He was 83. The Duke had wanted a simple, private burial, but it was not to be. Instead, he was given a lavish funeral here at St Paul's. His coffin was borne on an enormous 18-tonne funeral carriage, pulled by eight horses. A million people lined the streets. Today, perhaps 2,500 people would be allowed to attend such an occasion. On that day, 13,000 mourners were packed in here. After the service, a long and sonorous list of the Duke's many titles and honours was read out. Then his staff of office was snapped in two and thrown into the grave. Many people wept openly, aware that for once, cliché was reality. This was the end of an era. <laughs>